Iona. When your first name stands out by itself, you are a legend. Iona Campagnolo has a resume filled with firsts and high achievements. Alderwoman, MP, Federal Minister, Chair of the Calgary Olympic Development Organization, President of the Liberal Party of Canada, Chancellor, UNBC, Lieutenant Governor of BC and Queen's Viceroy, to name just a few. After a career really filled with contributions, Iona retired, but took on one of her biggest personal challenges. She tripped, fell, broke her neck, but not her spirit. Iona is a tour de force. Your Honor, thank you for joining us for this conversation in this magnificent garden surrounded by flowers. Thank you. The flowers have always been a love of yours, haven't they? Yes, yes. The Prince Rupert Garden Club is responsible for my political career. How is that? <laughs> they nominated me for city council at one point. So that was the beginning. Uh, I had spent six years on uh, school board previous to that, but uh, away I went. <laughs> and you really probably consider yourself um, a girl who grew up in the North and understands the North, Prince Rupert? Yes. Well, actually, as a child on Galliano, where we all came from, my father would work at this fish cannery and return in October. And then suddenly he got around the clock, around the uh, a whole job, and we all moved to, to North Pacific Cannery on the Skeena River. And I was seven, very impressionable just loved it and uh, well there were so many things but when I think of now often is when the wolves would call to each other all the way up in the winter along the, the edge of the river and you could hear them as far as they would go and the people that's where I first learned a great deal about the various kinds different different uh, homes and uh, the, the tribal groups. So in that case, there was the uh, the Gipsan, the Simpsian, and the Niska, who were all at the cannery at that time. And later years, of course, we had the famous Niska Treaty, the first the treaty of British yes. Columbia. And we were also proud of them for the leadership they showed in moving that entire process forward. And then, of course, many more treaties were signed in British Columbia. But we have to remember at one time, we were the only province with no treaties. You mentioned school board as your first start into public life, really. Yes. Why did you run for school board? I had two children and I, I wanted to influence the way in which they were educated. Yes. And then, from that experience, your garden club nominated you for alderman. I was six years chairman of the school board before I ran for city council. So why did politics, uh, you were very young, yeah. why did politics appeal to you, even from that stage? Well, when you actually think about it, it's the only way to change things. And if indeed you want to shift the way in which our society is moving, the one place to do it is in political life. So you always saw politics as a place to change the world? Yes, to improve and to work towards uh, goals that had been agreed were improvements over what we presently had. Yes. And of course, in the North, there was always this difficulty in recruiting professionals to spend their time working in the various necessities like health care and education. So how did you make the decision that you would like to go to Ottawa and be a federal member of parliament? Oh, I didn't make that decision at all. Um, I was second in command of a small radio station. The manager said, come, let's go to lunch. He was supposed to be the candidate for the Liberal Party in the next election 
in the uh, riding of Skeena, which had been held by Frank Howard for the last, I don't know how many years, forever, uh, of the New Democratic Party. And so uh, off we went to lunch and he said, I can't be the candidate. My wife is ill and I have to. So I said, oh, well, we'll find another candidate. Yes, he said, it's you. And that was how I became the candidate and went to the party meeting in Smithers and a large number of people, maybe 12, 15, <laughs> nominated me and I happened to be elected just for one one uh, period of time. Turned out to be five years, the full five years, 1974 to 1979. So in 1976, Pierre Elliott Trudeau named me a parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs, as it was called then. And then shortly after that, he named me Minister of Sport, Fitness and Sport. And uh, that was a very uh, exciting prospect, bringing together things such as Sport Canada, the uh, Coaching Association, and so on. It was brilliant. What was it like when you come from Prince Rupert and you show up in Ottawa <laughs> and you're the new elected member? Well, they treated me as if I had come from Mars, first of all. <laughs> it was very difficult. So anyway, yes, uh, they, they felt I was very exotic and I had to laugh about that. And then there was the other thought, well, women are just coming out. They treated us as if we'd just taken off our kitchen apron and walked into their parlor uh, in some ways. Um, it was beginning though, and most of them had no idea that Prince Rupert had had the first woman mayor in 1948. <laughs> and so they looked at you probably a little askance and thought, yep. you know, what do you have to offer? Who are you? I was in my 40s. I knew how to do a balance sheet. I was properly trained, I thought, in how to handle a meeting. And uh, I guess I was. From the outside, people would look at you as a cabinet minister and sitting around the cabinet table with the prime minister and think, it must be such a, a tight, powerful relationship. Did you ever feel, you know, sort of isolated at the table? The, the person who helped me the most was Jean Chrétien. So your experience in Ottawa was a positive one? Oh, I think so. Uh, I mean, it was fierce and it was mean, and I know they have a lot more trolls today with the social media, but we had really, you know, extreme um, anger too, and uh, my, the, because I supported the right for a woman to choose, I always had the anti-choice for that faction, uh, carrying placards and, and doing various things to, uh, un, to undermine me, I guess. Um, that was very fierce and very difficult. And I now today relate to people like uh, Catherine McKenna almost driven from office with the vile behavior on social media. So when you had that um, sort of criticism or personal attacks coming at you, did it get inside? Sometimes, yes. I remember, for example, three religious gentlemen, you know, themselves just as rude as they could possibly be when we might have had a conversation about the issue, and many, many more <laughs> placards and so on. Actually, once in Thunder Bay, I have to tell you, it was I was heading into a meeting in, in a hotel in downtown Thunder Bay, and there was a huge demonstration against me on the issue of anti-choice. And suddenly this group of women in white dresses and roses singing bread and roses came down and pushed their way through so that I could get into the hotel where I was to speak. And I always thought, what a marvelous thing. Women supporting women. 
And you felt that? Oh, at that moment, yes. Yes. It's so hard to get good people to consider politics these days, and I think you've identified one of the major reasons. Uh, social media is brutal. Yes. And if you've ever made any mistake ever in your life, there it's going to be on the front page of the paper. Yeah. What do we do about that? Don't make mistakes earlier in life. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I don't think it's ever going to be ameliorated uh, because it's part of the political theater and gotcha moments. We've just seen one here with regard to the prime minister and going to Tofino. Yes, he should have called. Where was his staff work? Where were the people writing the letters of, and uh, acknowledging the invitations and doing the preliminary work that a prime minister requires? You know, that well, one of the things that um, you found out is, of course, in politics, sometimes you don't win. No. Nope. And so you had a loss. Um, how did that affect you? Oh, it hurt, of course. I had driven that riding Highway 37, Highway 16, going to visit everyone I could, doing the back work that they needed, all of the problems that they gave me, and uh, building as much confidence as I could. And then you lose. I lost, and it, yes. So anyway, I spent a year where, working for CBC. But then I was asked to run for president of the Liberal Party of Canada. And they never had a woman president before? No, no. So you said yes, and yes. you became the first woman president of the Federal Liberal Party. Was it strange going to behind the scenes? You'd been in front yes. of everyone before. Well, the same work, building the constituencies, raising the money, you know, making sure that you had adequate responses to the public, and so on. Uh, the work is not that different. It's just huge. Well, you certainly made some headlines. You didn't make headlines. John Turner made headlines. Oh, yes. When he, um, you were on stage or in a group yes. together, and he gave you a pat on the backside. Well, it was never a bum pat. It was a pat on the back of my hip, which was then turned into a caused celeb in the media. It was huge headlines. Yes, it was huge. And I think it cost me the election I was running in at the time. John was, you know, a wonderful man. And uh, he was just nervous. That was all. And today, you can imagine that he wouldn't have lasted a day in the job after if, if somebody did that today to a woman Oh, gosh, stage. no, no. no. But, you had to put up with people, men, walking into your personal space, you know, leaning on you from time to time or whatever. Uh, that kind of thing was constant. And we all survived, but we all know how it worked. How did you handle it? Stepping out of the way. Keeping out of the way, yes. One other comment you made, of course, was uh, when the balloting was coming forward for the leadership of the uh, Federal Liberal Party. And uh, you referred to Jean Chrétien as being second in the balloting, but first in our hearts? Yep, first in my heart. They didn't say that then, they said our hearts. Uh, well, it was just the plain truth. And, though, and I, I'll have to tell you, I was walking up on the stage to make that announcement, and I looked over and I saw all of Jean Chrétien's forces from Quebec. And I knew if I didn't say something positive, they would walk out of the party. There was that upsetting moment when I realized that Shawinigan was sitting there and the rest of Quebec and somehow or other I had to keep that part of the party in, in spite of John Kurt Turner's win. That's what it was. And so it was strategic? It was. That's what I was doing. 
you've had so many firsts in your life. Yes. You know, you think of all the firsts, you know, in your role as a cabinet minister, first woman for the federal liberal party, first chair of, of the University of Northern BC, a ch a chancellor, uh, first chair of um, the Fraser Basin Council. I mean, when I mention all those first, did you feel that ever as a burden, that people's expectations of you uh, were huge? They were watching you, you know, first woman this, first woman that. Did you feel an extra weight on your shoulders? Well, yes. Uh, you yourself will have encountered the same thing, being a first in any group. No matter what you do, you're being watched extremely carefully. And so therefore you do proceed with your very best, I think, in answer to that. And if that is not good enough, well, they'll certainly tell you. Someone will always tell you. <laughs> yes. The, the biggest one, of course, is the first woman lieutenant governor yes. of BC. What a tremendous honor. Oh, I was very honored to receive that. And uh, when the Prime Minister called and asked me if I would take the post, and uh, I said, yes. And I said, well, what do you want me to do with it? Well, he said, whatever you think is correct. Were you surprised when the Prime Minister called? Yes. Yes, I was. I hadn't expected anything like that. But I knew I could do the job just knew innately. Perhaps it was arrogant of me, but uh, it was a wonderfully interesting six years. How did you see the role? Oh, uh, as representative of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, here in British Columbia, and uh, you sign all the documents on her behalf, and uh, I would end every speech with um, reference to the Queen. And uh, when I talked with Her Majesty about it, she, and I said, did she want me to have any special thing to say? Oh no, whatever you think is great. So she couldn't have been more outgoing about it. A remarkable woman too, we have to say there. Woman leadership has shown itself to be strong, resilient, able. So the lieutenant governor has the opportunity to shape the office a little bit. Yes. And so everyone is different. Yes. And when you look at the influence that you had in that role, what part are you most proud of? I don't have a big uh, business of pride in this thing or that thing. In my view, you do the best you can, and that's what it is. Um, I have been very fortunate in my life, and I can look back on these things with pleasure, but other people will judge whether or not they were really worthwhile. It seems to me that your relationship with First Nations from the time you were a child, right through your political career, has been extremely important. Yes. Well. So assessing the situation today, in light of the Kamloops Residential School, the efforts at reconciliation, are we making progress? We will make progress. I don't think we are at the present time. But uh, it's taking a while for people to digest the colonialism that led to us all being here. I mean, sometimes, when I'm listening and thinking about all of that, I know what has to be said is, what land are you on? Whose land have you got? Here in British Columbia, where we had so many First Nations, right here, this is the territory of the Comox First Nation. And we should recognize that. I don't know of anybody's success story that doesn't have challenges. And of course, you had a major challenge with your accident. Yes. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, I got food poisoning, and I was very sick in my home. 
And uh, on one occasion, walking back to my bed, I fell and hit my head on the wall and broke my neck. And so I was there for 19 hours before anyone found me. <laughs> Old ladies like myself living alone, you know. And uh, then they rushed me off to Vancouver General. They did a very good job. And uh, as you see, here I am in my wheelchair. And so how has this changed your life? Well, I had finished all that I intended to do in the public sphere. I was just getting ready to go and be retired. I was 75 when it happened. And uh, so it's changed my life a lot, but I had already changed my life. After leaving Lieutenant Governor, there's nothing worse than someone who hangs around too long after the show. Get off the stage when the time comes. And so you had decided to retire? Yes. And you had your house just perfectly the way you liked it. Exactly. And I had three grandchildren and three great-grandchildren later. And I was looking forward to all that. They still show up, but it was a little different than I planned. You seem to have adjusted so well. Well, there's no alternative. Either adjust or don't. And you chose to adjust and yes. enjoy life? Yes, as much as possible. At this point in your life, you've got a big birthday coming up. Yes. Do you like birthdays? Oh, what the heck. Yes. When you look back then on your life story, what do you hope your legacy or memories are for other people? Well, I hope that if anything, it offers a thought of, courage when you're given a challenge take it take it with both hands and give it everything you possibly can and uh, hopefully that is, is it that is a reward you have to think of women who were not able to do this over the centuries and we are we're given an open door and that's why we have to Challenge, meet the challenge and, and be, be gracious about it. Don't, the meanness and the cruelty and all that attendant activity is, uh, it's a sideline to it. Do what you can to stop it. Thank you for all you've done. Oh, it's been a joy. Thank you for your public service. I've got the sun in my eyes now. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> Iona Campagnola, an inspiring BC legend, one of our own.